Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, you know, we're recovering from our, our massive snowstorm. Of, I think it was two inches of snow we got. And, and, and my banana plants, as I reported a couple of weeks ago, or last week. They're not doing well. Prognosis is extremely bad. We might have to call 911 on the banana plants. I don't think they're gonna make it. But the good news, the vultures are back. Vultures are back. They've been coming so often that we named them. We had to name them, and my sister would love this. We, I'm not going to go into details, but they're named Bob and Phil. That's my parents' <laughs> names. <laughs> anyway, we're glad they're back, and, and I think they're taking up residence. We're very excited. Now, you would think, since I'm talking about avian flu a lot, I wouldn't be so excited about having wild, predatory birds right outside, but, you know, it gives you something to worry about. You always need something to worry about. So. Speaking of avian flu and wild birds, there's been a couple of developments that are important to uh, catch up on. So right now, uh, for avian flu, we've had about, we've had 67 reported cases in people, uh, 36, or the most of them are in California cattle uh, handlers, and then also in poultry handlers. And I showed you the pictures, <laughs> I think it was last week, of runny nose in cattle and conjunctivitis in people. But it's been really devastating to uh, animals. There have been 11,000 wild birds that have died, 147 million poultry that have been culled because of this. So to explain what the new development is in the bird flu, I'm gonna have to go back and do, just review a little bit of science, Janet, not too much. But remember, there are four subtypes of influenza, A, B, C, and D. We don't talk about C and D too much because C doesn't really cause very much illness in humans, and D, is mostly in cattle, occasionally spears, spills over to other animals, but it's not really a virus that affects people. So the main ones are A and B. So in, in influenza A is further subdivided based on the two major proteins on its cell surface, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. And currently the most common circulating uh, influenza A viruses are H1N1 and H3N2. So let me show you a picture of an influenza virus, a diagram. The red represents the neuraminidase uh, protein and the blue represents the hemagglutin protein. There are 18 different hemagglutin subtypes and 11 different uh, neuraminidase subtypes. So you can imagine more than 130 influenza A subtypes with all these different combinations. And, and it's important to recognize that because the new development is that we've had the first outbreak of a new avian influenza virus, H5N9. So this is the first time we've seen it. It's in, it was detected uh, in poultry on a duck farm in California. So, you know, I'm sure the ducks got it from wild birds and then they infected the uh, poultry. Uh, on that same farm, they detected H5N1 as well. And so on that farm, 119,000 animals or, or birds have, or chicken have been called. Uh, the H5N9 strain is a concern because it's much rarer, but it's much more pathogenic. And otherwise, it causes, in other words, it causes more disease uh, when it is present. So, very concerning. Uh, what about this H5N9? It was uh, first described in 2015. It's a it's a mutation that is a resortment of a bunch of genes in H5N1, H7N9, and H9N2. So this is the classic situation with. With uh, influenza A viruses, if they get into a single animal, they can recombine, resort their genes. Uh, and then in 2015, H5N9 uh, acquired a particular gene, an H5 gene, that was uh, and an N9 gene from humans. So that was a big concern because it makes it more likely that it might jump into people. Uh, of course, it hasn't so far in the first indication. But it's kind of scary because now we have another avian flu uh, that's arrived. Now, you remember, I was, I was talking about people who are always <laughs> criticizing people like me who feed our dogs kibble and they feel their dogs fresh, fresh food and a couple of cats died from fresh food. Well, the FDA has now changed its recommendation 
and says that all, uh, and all pet food companies need to revisit their safety plans because, there's this, because of the bird flu out, outbreak. Now, uh, cats appear to be especially vulnerable to the H5N1, non H5N1 virus, and several cats have died from infected raw turkey in fresh food. And so the CDC and the American Veterinary Medical Association now discourage the feeding of uncooked meat diets to uh, companion animals, uh, particularly those that are, have any proximity to H5N1. Now, <laughs> that said, Lily said you can continue to feed it to cats. So <laughs> there's no problem there as much as you want. Anyway, so people uh, who get these fresh foods often think that if they freeze it, it'll kill the virus, but it doesn't. So the only way to kill it is to actually uh, cook the food. So for people who want to stick foolishly to their raw food, raw, raw food uh, for their animals, it's best if you cook it before uh, you feed it to them, which is kind of defeats the purpose, I guess. So I'm sticking with my my kibble fed for the, for the for the for Lily, and she doesn't mind. Okay, there's also been for the first time an avian flu case that was dis detected in the UK. So. An, ind an individual who was working on a farm in West Mid Midlands com uh, contracted it, uh, and, but that farm was shown to have many infected birds, so we assume it came from that. So uh, when you start thinking about what's going on now with influenza A and B, the standard influenzas, uh, it's this influenza A, main circulating one is H1N1. Uh, we've talked about this for several times, but it's interesting because that is a subtype that was really uh, present in the pandemic of 20 of 2009. So this is sort of classic. It was a pandemic, major strain, H1N1. It's gone, undergone several mutations and now has become just sort of a seasonal virus and is the dominant, um, uh, one of the dominant strains that's circulating. H3N2 has also changed a lot. It was, it's been circulating a, uh, quite, a, quite a long time. Uh, it has many genetic variants. Uh, it's, it's sort of like when we follow the COVID branch chain of, of variations similar to that, and they continue to circulate uh, annually. Uh, influenza B this year is very low. In, unlike influenza A, which is defined by the H and the N proteins, influenza B is defined by where it was identified. So first identified in Yamagata, uh, Japan, or Victoria, Australia. So they're either the Yamagata strain or the Victoria strain. They do not, there's slow, more slowly uh, changes in them. Uh, and they have not caused pandemics like uh, the influenza A viruses have. Uh, and as you'll recall, with COVID, uh, Yamagata sort of disappeared and hasn't been around for a while, so who knows. The big concern, of course, is nationally, we're not doing very well with vaccinations. Uh, you know, right now we're, we're at 43%. Uh, the estimate for Texas is even lower, 37%. And Houston is slightly better than the rest of Texas at 39%. But I showed you this graph, uh, I think a week ago or two weeks ago, each year vac the vaccination sufficiency gets less and less and less. So this is where we are on the red curve, and it's less than in previous years. And the target for to prevent a lot of influenza from spreading is a 70% rate. And we've gone over the R number, the reason for that. So we're not we're not doing very well as a nation in terms of vaccine readiness for influenza, and so not surprisingly, it's all over the place. And in fact, the CDC is reporting that we're really high levels of most of the respiratory viruses right now. For influenza, admissions to emergency rooms is very, very high. The test positivity for tests coming through the emergency room are 25%. COVID-19 and RSV are somewhat lower, 6.2 and 8.8% uh, respectively. And in wastewater, influenza A is very, very high. So, you know, it's, it's, we're right in the middle of this season and uh, vaccinations are lagging behind. This is just a graphic of the number of test positivity and the number of emergency room visits. And you can see influenza in the blue is extremely high, RSV and COVID somewhat less. And the influenza variety that is there, A is in yellow and B is in green. You can see the vast majority is influenza A. And if you subtype that, the vast majority of those, H3 uh, is in red and H1 is in orange. And so, so you can see H3 and, and H1 are the ones that are really circulating. COVID has been not so bad. It's coming up a little bit, but as you can see lately, the emergency room 
visits have been declining. And if you look at hospitalizations, it's really kind of interesting. The, this is hospitalizations for COVID from 2021 in green, 2022 in blue, 23 in red, and this year. And what you can see is right after the, the pandemic, we had a lot of hospitalizations, but each year it seems to be getting less. And that's, it. that's probably because we have generalized more immunity. People are vaccinated or have been exposed to it. And we haven't had a dramatic change in the genetics of that particular virus recently. So it's sort of tapping down to be a seasonal uh, virus. This is the wastewater data for COVID-19. It's peaked, but it looks like it's probably plateau at this point. And as I said, it's the same strain. It's XEC is the same dominant strain. It, it's about 47% of the viruses out there. So we're in the middle of respiratory season being dominated mostly by influenza, uh, influenza A, uh, with a little bit of RSV and COVID. And then the concern, of course, is for the avian flu. Hopefully it will not become a giant pandemic, but you never know. Uh, hopefully we're all ready for vaccines. I as I said all along, we should be testing more and probably treating, vaccinating uh, poultry and uh, dairy workers, in my view. All right, one in today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, on February 11th, the Baylor College of Medicine will host a volunteer opportunity at the Aishel House on University Boulevard. The Aishel House is a residential, religious, and social service center that provides patients and families who are of all faiths who are visiting the Texas Medical Center. We have family members who are sick and are staying here. It's very hard for families sometimes to have, uh, find a place to stay. They provide this uh, the residency at the Aishel House and they provide support for them. So if you're interested in volunteering, there's a form. Uh, also, Baylor Medicine Orthopedics and Sports Medicine has expanded its services to the Kirby Glen location, joining our physical therapy practice uh, on Brazewood Boulevard. This expansion offers patients convenient access to comprehensive orthopedics care, including sports medicine and general orthopedic services. Uh, those are provided by Dr. Philip Williams, an assistant professor, and Amber Brindell, a, a, a nurse practitioner. Uh, anyway, we're excited about this. It ex expands our, our services for orthopedics and physical therapy. And of course, this, this is the year of the snake. We're excited about being the year of the snake. I have no idea what that means. I don't know if that's good or bad. But anyway, I do know that the Asian American communities will be, have, will be joyfully celebrating uh, and we will have many events to come. At Baylor, the festivities will be held Monday, February 3rd from 11 to 1 in the courtyard. A lion dance uh, performance will take place at 12.30. Why isn't it a snake dance? I guess you have that with the dragon dance. No, oh, whatever. Uh, anyway, the ba Baylor Chinese Students and Scholar Association is presenting and the Society of Chinese Bioscientists in America will sponsor the program. So we're very excited about the Year of the Snake. Anyway, have a great weekend and I can't wait to see you next week along with the vultures.